Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this installment of Tuesday Race Talks. This is our periodic discussion of pressing issues facing the American public that intersect with race and justice. Today, the topic is affirmative action. The past of affirmative action, and perhaps more importantly, the future of affirmative action. We have with us for this discussion two distinguished alums from Stanford Law School, uh, Tamika Butler and Kevin Lowe. Thank you both for joining the program today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Let me, let me briefly uh, introduce our uh, commentators and then we'll move on to the substance of the conversation. Tamika graduated from Stanford Law School in 09. Uh, doesn't seem that long ago. Uh, she is now the principal and founder of Tamika L. Butler Consulting which shines a light on inequality, inequity, and social justice. She provides consulting, training, coaching, and public speaking for a wide range of organizations in the public and private sector. Most recently, she was a director of planning uh, in California and the director of equity and inclusion at Tool Design. Previously, she served as the executive director of the Los Angeles Neighborhood Land Trust, which is a nonprofit organization addressing social and racial inequity and wellness, and as executive director of the Los Angeles County Bicycle Coalition. Prior uh, to leading those organizations, she was a director of social change strategies at Liberty Hill Foundation. She transitioned to policy work after litigating for three years as an employment uh, lawyer at Legal Aid, which she first joined as a Skadden Fellow. To all students, Skadden fellowships are good. They lead to good things. Let Tamika be a model. Okay, our other uh, panelist here is Kevin Lowe, graduated from Stanford Law School in 2011. Kevin is a staff attorney at the Immigrants' Rights Program at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, which is part of the Asian Law Caucus. He represents detained immigrants facing deportation, and he works with the elderly low-income community in San Francisco. Kevin previously worked on counterterrorism and human, human rights issues with Reprieve in London, and he assisted LGBTQ refugees and asylum seekers as well. He's led labor campaigns for workers' rights throughout Southeast Asia and the American South with the United Auto Works. At Stanford, uh, he was involved in many organizations, including Outlaw, uh, the Levin Center, and the Immigrants' Rights Clinic. We are delighted to welcome back both of these esteemed and energetic alums for this conversation about affirmative action. Before we move into that conversation, let me just set the, some, some groundwork and provide a foundation, just provide a thumbnail sketch of history. Affirmative action is usually understood to have begun about half a century ago. It was part of the effort to dismantle the system of American apartheid known as Jim Crow. The impulse that led to affirmative action programs was a simple one. It was that you can't just stop doing a bad thing and then think that everything is okay. You need to do something more than stop the bad stuff. You need to do something that's affirmative. This was the same sort of impulse that informed the reconstruction period after the end of the Civil War. People recognized that nearly ending slavery would not itself be enough to bring freedom. Instead, there was a need for some reconstruction or some constructive or some affirmative effort to promote justice and freedom. So too during the 1960s did America make efforts to move forward and move closer to our aspiration of racial justice. Affirmative action was one of the means to, to doing so. Although the case for affirmative action might seem clear, the, the program and the policies that travel under that rubric have always been in battle. They've been controversial in the court, and they've also been controversial in the court of public opinion. As a result, in California, for example, affirmative action in the 1990s was banned. There was a statewide ballot initiative known as Prop 209, with the purpose, uh, with the, and the purpose of that was to prohibit state agencies, which includes agencies that extend contracts, and includes educational institutions that are that are that are state run. State agencies were prohibited from extending so-called preferences uh, on the basis of race. Prop 209 has been and remains the law in California. Currently though, 
uh, we are confronted with a ballot initiative, Proposition 16, which would potentially change, rescind Prop 209. Prop 16 is a pro-affirmative action measure that would give back to state agencies the power to take race into account in their decision making. This is a ballot initiative that we'll, we'll talk about during this discussion as we try to make sense of these policy issues. Uh, but for now, let me just say that affirmative action is as timely an issue as there can be, because we have an initiative on the ballot that would reverse more than two decades of policy in California. And that ballot initiative, 2000, uh, Prop 209, in turn reversed several decades of pro-affirmative action policy initiatives in the state of California. So with that said, uh, let's move to the presenters. Uh, so Tamika, let's start with you. Uh, Proposition 16 would reverse Prop 209 and make affirmative action again permissible. Uh, what do listeners need to know or understand about Prop 16 and the battle surrounding affirmative action? Thanks, Professor Banks. I really appreciate um, being here, going from being one of your students to a co-panelist with you. Uh, it's a little I surreal. Rick, I call you Tamika, you can call me Rick. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. I'll, I'll work on that. Um, but yeah, you know, I think one of the most important things uh, to know is that, you know, we, we need to repeal Prop 209. But beyond that, I think something you said in the opening is, is what's really important and what I've learned in my practice and whether or not that was my practice as an employment discrimination lawyer or whether or not it's my practice now as a practitioner that specializes in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Even if we are able to repeal Prop 209, which I think many of us really hope we are, there still has to be affirmative work, right? We can't just stop doing something and expect that things will get better, that it will just magically um, reappear. Now, certainly it will help, right? It will absolutely help in the state of California to have that thing that's been holding back so much change lift it. Um, but we also know that there's a larger landscape. We know that the legal world right now, there are hearings happening um, that could dramatically change the legal world. We have a Supreme Court that, that you know, says that affirmative action has passed their strict scrutiny. Um, and, and that's, you know, schools have to try other things and then they can get to this piece about race. And so this has, this has been litigated. It's been litigated to the highest court. But what we're seeing and what we so often see as California is we might be in one place where we're ready to do something in our local election, but the, the, federal, the federal, you know, judiciary or, or um, elected officials might not be in the same place. And so it's both going to be, can we pass this? But then can we realize that just simply changing it will not in and of itself result in change? Just like companies simply putting out a statement saying they support black lives, will in and of itself make them more diverse companies. And so I think we have to constantly be thinking on multiple fronts. What are the policy routes we can take? Um, what are the advocacy, uh, you know, policy advocacy? Um, what are the organizing? What are the legal? And what are, frankly, as individuals, what are the concrete things we can do to start to actualize some of this change? Okay, but before we move to Kevin, let me just put that question back at you. So if, if passing Prop 16 is actually not enough, if that's merely one step in a longer journey, uh, what are the other steps in that journey concretely? Um, what more needs to happen to promote change? Something that I, a lot of, of folks in, in my current field, so folks who you know, have been chief equity officers mm -hmm. or worked in the employment um, space have said, is that too often we like to think that you can make a change of policy or that you can have a task force or that you can hire um, you know, a chief equity person and a team and that's gonna create the change. But really what a lot of this change comes down to is will and leadership. The folks who are in leadership positions have to make this a priority and they have to want these things to change. So our institutions, the leaders of our institutions, no matter what happens on the ballot, they have to be ready to actualize it, right? And I think a great example is the NFL. The NFL, as, we, as many of us know, has their Rooney rule, that when they're hiring new head coaches, they have to interview at least one person of color, right? And so they've had a policy change. And then at the end of last season, 
most, if not all of the black head coaches were let go mm-hmm. and in their place, despite the fact that black coaches got interviews in their mm-hmm. place were mostly hired white head coaches, right? And so that's the thing with policy change. If you don't have the will to see it through to actual change, and if you don't have leadership who is willing to, cre- to commit time and resources and not just reallocate resources, but also find new resources, which I think is hard for people when they think of 2020 and the economic crisis we're facing, but we have to realize that just retrofitting equity into our hiring and our admissions decisions it takes more money. Anytime you retrofit something, it costs more. So it's going to mm-hmm. take more money. It's going to take more time and it's going to take specific will from our leaders. Okay. We're, we're going to come back to that. Um, but Kevin, uh, your view on prop 16, what do people need to know from, from your vantage point? Sure. I think first of all, I'll just echo, I mean, I'm echoing what Tamika said. I think obviously Prop 16 is fixing an issue that California got wrong back in 96. And like Prop 16 is an opportunity to bring back affirmative action. Um, It it feels like in the last two decades since we got rid of affirmative action in California, we've seen that the fears that um, people really stoked around its passage didn't really happen. Um, We can look at the consequences of what happened after affirmative action has gotten rid of. And it's clear that there needs to be an answer. um, And one that like, can't necessarily go through the courts. So I think one thing I wanted to flag, um, I'm sure we'll get into it more deeply in the next hour, but I think one thing is that if you look at the war on words, the Mm -hmm. kind of vocabulary that both sides are using hasn't changed. And kind of in the discussion we were having even before this webinar started, it's kind of this sense that what was old is new again. So again, we're still talking about, like at least from the conservative side that's trying to dismantle affirmative action, or to prevent its return. They're saying things like, we just want things to be race blind. We want things to be determined by merit. And it's something that Professor Banks, you alluded to in the beginning. It's, you can't just say, let's stop doing the bad thing and then move on. Um, I think there's a lot of, there's a bigger sense of like not wanting to be reminded of how bad things were and where people started. And then there's a lot of emphasis on where we want to go as a society. And then I think the other point I want to quickly make is that Again, we're seeing kind of the use of Asian Americans as a cohesive block being used as a wedge issue where it's being projected and being sold to the Asian American community as it's, it's Asians against everyone else. So it's like Asians plus white people against the black and brown folks. And like when you actually talk to communities of color, when you actually talk to Asian Americans of different groups, like that's simply not the case. Okay. This is, so there's a lot there, which we will come back to, but let me go back to this foundational issue for, for both of you, because it, it seems as though support for affirmative action has waxed and waned. Um, and, you know, right now, Prop 16, it's not clear that it will pass or that it will be defeated, right? It's, it's a close race, if you will. Uh, and many of those people who might be wavering or who might even vote against the measure they're gonna look out at the world and say something like, look, um, I think affirmative action was really necessary in 1968, uh, maybe even in 1978, when the Supreme Court decided Bakke v. University of California Regents. Um, you know, sure, it was necessary then, but now it's 2020. We are just about half a century after the onset of affirmative action. Uh, half a century later, uh, America is a different place. Uh, it's a less racist place, a less discriminatory place. We have more minorities um, of, of all types who are in positions of power. We even had an African-American president, right? So this is what people tell themselves. And in their view, they think that now is, is the time to be colorblind. We, we've done the affirmative action thing. We've done enough of that. Why can't we finally be colorblind now? And what that means is not engaging in affirmative action. So. How do you respond to that uh, hypothetical voter? I think, I guess I was smiling a bit while the presentation of the straw man argument <laughs> happened. No, just no, <laughs> no, I know. But I think on a certain level, I think it's hard to have lived through the United States of this summer, even if we just mm-hmm. focus on the summer, like the murder of George Floyd, and to say that race doesn't matter. Like race obviously matters a lot in America. And it's like the reality of ongoing racism and segregation shapes 
all of our lives. And I think there's a certain amount of obviously denial um, or like it just doesn't impact certain people as much as others. Right. So I think it's just, I think what I would say is that the way that certain groups see race, it's just that they would rather not deal with it. But if we look at all the data of how it's like impacted and improved the lives of many minority groups, mm -hmm. there's no question that like it's something that's a net positive. Yeah, I, to I totally agree with Kevin. I think there is this desire of folks to look away. I think part of why the murder of George Floyd felt tr so transformative is because folks were stuck inside um, because of, of COVID-19. And so folks saw, saw it, you know, I haven't watched the video, but I think it was hard to, to escape it. And, you know, I was on a panel yesterday um, with educators from the Western United States talking about how they wanted to incorporate equity and diversity into everything they do on, on um, college campuses. And one of my co-panelists was a member of the Little Rock Nine, you know, the group of nine Black students who enrolled at, at Little Rock Central High um, and ultimately were, were stopped by the governor of Arkansas. And this man, who, who is a member of what was happening back then, said that he recently had a conversation with his grandkids, who are, are teens now, and said, I'm sorry that my generation didn't do more, that we didn't, we, that we didn't fix some of these problems because they're still here. So for me, if he's telling me they're still here, then they're still here, right? And I, I, I think to Kevin's point, you can't just simply, simply look away from that or fail to acknowledge that because it's uncomfortable. Now, are you able to acknowledge, like ignore it? Sure, if you have a certain amount of privilege and, and you don't have to experience these things every single day. But I think for many of us, you know, I inhabit a black body every day. And so mm -hmm. I, know, I know that many of these barriers are still in place. They're still mm -hmm. very real. Um, and from, you know, 1957 and Little Rock, Arkansas um, to 2020, across the country, there are still students of color um, who either, one, are not in schools because of all the other laws and policies we've had that have segregated communities, or who are still being kept out of institutions of higher education, of jobs, of opportunities, away from resources, because we have a country that's built on white supremacy, and that hasn't mm -hmm. changed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this, our hypothetical voter is listening to what you're saying, but that for that voter is, I mean, I want to really get this out because people are feeling so that that voter might respond that they recognize that what happened to George Floyd was horrific, right? It was horrific. That was a tragedy. They want the police officers to be prosecuted. They recognize that race still matters in policing and elsewhere, but they're not clear on how affirmative action in government contracting, employment, college admissions, how that relates to what happened with George Floyd. So they would say, sure, let's reform policing so that bad things don't happen to anyone and especially don't happen to, to black men like that. But they're also in favor of colorblindness more generally. Is that inconsistent or are, are they missing something? I, I think they're inconsistent. <laughs> I, think you can't, I think you can't say you, you care about these issues, but that you wish people were just colorblind. Unless, again, you haven't done enough to fully understand privilege and you haven't done enough to fully unpack your own privilege. And, and part, of, part of the reasoning is, is because all of these things are linked, right? Like there, a lot of my work now is in transportation mm -hmm. and I always say to people, there's a reason we have expressions like the other side of the tracks because mm -hmm. we have passed policies and procedures that have historically done everything they can to keep certain groups of people as the other, to keep mm -hmm. them away from economic mobility, for educational mobility, um, mm -hmm. from all types of mobility, right? And so, yes, you might say the, the policing of Black people is very different than the educating of Black people, but we also know that the policing of Black people starts for many young Black folks in the education system. Mm -hmm. And so all of these things are piled up. And so what I always say is that for many low-income folks and folks of color, their communities are literally killing them. Whether or not it's the zoning that allow, allows for toxic sites, whether or not it's their segregated public school system and their inability to kind of transition out of that, 
whether or not it's the historical ways that black people have been stopped from amassing um, mm -hmm. land ownership and wealth, all of these things add up so that even when some of us are able and, and lucky enough and blessed and supported enough to make it to institutions of higher education or the possibility, we still have to take standardized tests, mm -hmm. which still have racial bias, right? Mm -hmm. We still have to get into these programs. And mm -hmm. so I think sometimes folks who want colorblind, let's say, I just wish we didn't have to talk about race all the time. And the reality is the reason we talk about race all of the time is because the folks who have historically held power, white people, mm -hmm. they wanted it that way. Mm -hmm. I wish we didn't have to talk about race all the time too. But when people see me, they don't see that I'm a Stanford educated lawyer, mm -hmm. right? There were times at Stanford where I got stopped on campus by campus police asking mm -hmm. if I belong there. There were times mm -hmm. where I was going to lead a like know your rights workshop for youth and I was almost stopped from going in because the people thought I was a gang member and that I wasn't allowed to wear certain colors even though I'm on campus. And so mm -hmm. we have to realize that all of these things are tied and that, yeah, it would be great if we didn't always have to talk about race, but that's an alternative universe that we don't currently live in. We live mm -hmm. in this one and people talk about race, people see our race. And mm -hmm. so just because you, you decide you don't want to doesn't make it not so. Okay. So, so you're persuading our hypothetical voter. The last, the last quibble they have, and they've been hesitant to voice this, is that you know, they, they recognize that maybe there's a need for affirmative action. Um, maybe African-Americans and others have gotten a raw deal and we need to do something to redress that. But they can't let go of this idea that it's really unfair to them or their child, right, or their family members. Um, it's unfair to them to have a, quote, preference uh, involved in employment, in contracting, or in school admissions. What do you, how do you respond to that? I'll take that first. I think it's an interesting issue because it's something that journalists always focus on whenever the affirmative action discussion happens. And I actually noticed it this morning because the high school that I went to in San Francisco is currently beginning that conversation again. So I'm sure many of you are aware of Lowell High School in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. It was the subject of like a federal consent order because at a certain mm -hmm. point, I think the student body was like 70% Asian, um, and the rest was white, and then black and brown kids were being kept out. And then there was a lot of discussion about affirmative action, and ultimately, like, Chinese parents ended up suing um, to get rid of affirmative action policies. And now it's back in the news again, simply because, um, because of the pandemic, because there are no test scores, no GPAs, the school is considering doing a San Francisco-wide lottery. No GPA requirements, no standardized test requirements. And then one quote that really stuck with me from a parent um, I'm going to read it to you. It's short. Um, so she has a, she has a student, um, sorry, she has a son that's about to go to high school. And she said, he might be one of those kids that would have had a good chance of getting into Lowell. And now it might be more equal for everyone else. So I just like, it just blows my mind that that was her reaction to this news was that now my child will have to be more equal to everyone else. And I feel like that almost gets at the crux of the situation where people see the calling out of inequality as a personal attack. And um, I can, I'm like, I can, I'm kind of sympathetic to like how families are feeling in that they're seeing it from this one dimension. Like they're not considering the broader social context because they don't need to, right? They're looking out for their child, for their family, for what they believe will set their child up for success. Mm -hmm. um, but when you have these reactions where it's like, there's just no consideration, it's just that there's a perception and again, it's not played out by the data, but there's a perception that if a black and brown child gets into the school, my child will have a less of a chance of getting in. And like, it just, it is astounding, but I don't think that dialogue is gonna change necessarily. Yeah, no, that's a great, interesting, but I've not heard about the low controversy. And, and it sounds like what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is that we should not support people in if they were to uh, complain about losing a privilege or an advantage that is itself the benef a, a consequence of inequality that's unjustified, right? So, so in other words, if making everything else fair or equitable for everyone else means that you lose something, well then you do lose it and you should have expected to maintain that privilege because it was actually unjustified all along, is that? I don't wanna put words in your mouth. But I think yeah, I think that's mostly right. I think where I'm, 
the crux of what I'm trying to get at is that I think it's easy to see the appeal to certain immigrant groups who are striving, right? Like there's a certain like perspective of we've worked really hard. And I think yeah. this is true of a lot of the East Asian groups, or at least the messaging to East Asian groups with regards to affirmative action. I think it's this promise of like, we're dangling the prospect of being welcomed into whiteness, like at least a spot adjacent to, to whiteness where there's a lot of privilege. Mm -hmm. This is the road that will ensure that your future generations will prosper. Mm -hmm. And then you're being told this very specific data like that's skewed on like enrollments versus mm -hmm. admissions. We won't get into that, but then Asian parents will see that and then panic. Like they're literally reacting to what will affect their individual child without regard for like what might be better as for the society in general. Okay, so now yeah. what I'm hearing now is, go ahead, Tamika. I was just gonna say it, and something you said, Professor Banks, on like, yeah, you might have to lose something because you might have um, unjustly had it to begin with. And I think for me, that's one of the biggest lessons I try to tell people, especially folks who are newly awoken and say, yeah, well, I want to be, you know, I want to be a, a warrior for racial justice, but what about my kid, right? Or yeah. what about me? And so, and so they have that struggle and they're like, but don't worry, I'm an ally. Yeah. And, and, and there is a difference, in my opinion, from being an ally and an accomplice. Mm -hmm. And I always mm -hmm. tell folks that, you know, there's actually a little bit of a journey you can take. You could start off as an actor. There are some times where you don't know why you're doing something, but you're just mm -hmm. kind of faking it until you make it because it's the right <laughs> thing to do. So someone tells you you should care about affirmative action, you care about affirmative action. <laughs> someone tells you you should use they, them pronouns, you do it. But yeah. if, you, if you don't start to actually internalize like and question your own power, your own privilege. Why am I using that pronoun? Why am I acknowledging that I'm on stolen Tongva land or calling it indigenous mm -hmm. people day? If I don't actually learn why I'm just going through the motions, then mm -hmm. at some point you'll be found out because you're just acting, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I always use Mel Gibson as an example. Great mm -hmm. actor, horrible human. Yep. Like yep. he can play the part, but he'll eventually mess up and say anti-Semitic mm -hmm. and like racist things. And then I think after you go from being an actor, you go to being an ally. And I think folks in, in this moment in history, I think a lot of folks are awakening to being an ally. They're mm -hmm. finally realizing that it's just not a noun. It's actually an action. Like they mm -hmm. have to do something. And so they might change their Facebook or their Instagram as a black square. They might say that they're gonna, you know, vote for something or do mm -hmm. something, but they wanna they wanna take action. So they'll make a donation and they'll do something. The difference between an accomplice and an ally is that accomplices are actually willing to lose something. Mm -hmm. And that transition is really hard for folks, right? And it's really hard when you think you're losing your spot mm -hmm. at a job you really want, at a higher education institution you want to get into, or even when you're losing esteem. And what folks don't realize is that for many folks of color, every day we show up as our authentic selves. Like we're risking yeah. something, yeah. right? And, and that's true for anybody in an oppressed group, queer people, people with yeah. disabilities, immigrants. And so it's, it's perfectly okay to be an ally where someone might say something in a meeting and you shoot them an email after or you pull mm -hmm. them aside and say, you know, Kevin, I really appreciate you saying that. I totally mm -hmm. agree with you. But you don't want to publicly speak up in the meeting that. because mm -hmm. you see how everybody talks about Kevin when he's not around. You see people mm -hmm. whispering when he's coming and saying, oh, there's the affirmative action guy again. And you don't want people to put you in that light because mm -hmm. you don't want to lose what you think you've worked for. You feel mm -hmm. like you've been climbing up this ladder to the mountaintop and you can almost see it. And then 2020 happened and you open your eyes for the first time and you're like, oh my gosh, I've been climbing the wrong mountaintop. I've mm -hmm. been doing it wrong, but you can't quite force yourself to climb down and start mm -hmm. over because you've somehow convinced yourself that you worked hard to get to that mm -hmm. point. That the mm -hmm. only reason you're almost at the mountaintop is because of all the tough climbing you did. And you're not willing to acknowledge who helped you get that ladder, who got out of your way or who wasn't in your way to get you up, who helped pull you up. And so the thought that you might have to climb back down, move the ladder to the proper mountaintop, maybe mm -hmm. let some other people go first mm -hmm. and then start climbing again, mm -hmm. that feels hard. And that's yes. what accomplices are, that you have to be willing to risk something. And everybody's just, everybody's not about that life. And so that's yes. hard for them. Yes. No, that's a, these are, that's a wonderful analogy uh, or metaphor. That's a one. And it, it reminds me of so many different issues. Um, and the core issue there, though, is that there's a point in this racial justice struggle where some people will be needed to realize that they actually do need to give up something. It's, it's not going to be win, win, win all the way down for everyone. Right. There have 
people have to give up something. Uh, and, and the one situation recently that reminds me of, uh, which is affirmative action of a sort, is uh, involving Serena Williams' husband, uh, uh, Alex Ohanian, I believe is his name. And he was on the board of, of a local company, a tech company here. Uh, he's a white man, and he wanted there to be more representation for African Americans. So he said he would step down from his board seat and that he wanted the seat to go to a person of color uh, and that he was willing to give up his seat for that. Uh, that was his effort. Uh, what do you, I assume you all are, think that's, a, that's kind of the thing that we need more of? Is that right? I think yes and no. I think yes. I think folks who have power have to realize it and be willing to relinquish it. I think, you know, the next step is how do you ensure that someone who is a person of color actually gets that seat? And so I think too often folks who have privilege or who are in positions of power, they start to feel guilty about mm -hmm. it. And then they have their white fragility and then they're sad about it or, or any type of fragility, right? Like I told my mom I was gay she stopped talking to me. Mm -hmm. And when I asked her why, she said, because what were people going to think of me? So as a Black woman, she had her own fragility around a certain mm -hmm. issue. And mm -hmm. so I think we have to both give up spots. But rather than feel bad or to say, well, I guess there's just not a place for me anymore as a white man, I think we, what I like about what he did is in addition to stepping down, he's also still taking action. He's yep. not just saying, I'm gonna step down, a person of colors and it's gonna come up in my place and then it's their job to do mm -hmm. this equity work. Mm -hmm. He's stepping down, he's giving his position, making sure someone is a person mm -hmm. of color, but then he's like investing in the women's soccer league. Right. He's doing right. all of these different things that are advancing both gender and racial equity mm -hmm. based on, again, now that he is personally impacted by it, right? Mm -hmm. He has a child who is a person of color. And so I think we need folks who are willing to relinquish power, but also for those who have it, how can they leverage it in ways? Mm -hmm. So you don't have to leave the board tomorrow, but if your term's up in a year, how are you angling for in that year to leverage the power that you now have to get someone in that position? And the only thing I would say is how do we get more folks who can do that work, even if it doesn't personally impact them, right? Again, he now has a wife and a, and a daughter who are black. And so now all of this stuff is so salient. And I, I, I've seen that happen with my white wife too. Mm -hmm. But as, as a group of us were sitting and, and talking, a group of my, my wife's white Canadian friends, they're all Canadian. And they were like, oh man, after this election, are we gonna have to move to Canada? And I was like, I don't know. I feel like the United States has always been racist. Why are you gonna move to Canada now? And one of them made a joke and it was a joke. And she said, but Tamika, now it's impacting me, right? Yes. Like as a white woman. And so we need, we all laughed, but it's like, no, but for real, how do we get more folks um, like, like you know Serena's husband mm -hmm. to say even if this doesn't personally impact me in a way that feels tangible I have a stake in this because right. even if I'm not married to a person of color or have a child who's a person mm -hmm. of color if you know I might depend on somebody who is a person of color to mm -hmm. to you know at my favorite lunch spot they mm -hmm. might be my janitor they might be my barber they might be my doctor mm -hmm. they might mm -hmm. be all of these things and so even if you don't feel like it personally impacts you folks have to start realizing that the folks that it does personally impact you probably depend on them in some yes. way and so you have a stake in this yes yeah let me let me just interject there i mean those are wonderful observations and uh i, I think you're exactly right that the challenge we confront here is how do we get everyone to care about race and equity, right? And my response to that challenge is to say that people need to understand that the race issues we have in our society, they're not just about the colored people, right? It's not that, you know, black people need help. The problem is that racism has always been the fault line of American society since its very founding. And that's a fault line that actually threatens to undo our democracy. And that was true in an undeniable sense at the time of the Civil War, and perhaps it's also true now. And so one thing that people maybe need to see is that they do have a stake in rectifying racism, because if we don't rectify racism, our democracy will be at risk. Uh, and that's something that I think right now people can understand in a way that's that's more real than would have been the case a year ago or certainly when Obama was president and, you know, everything seemed good to many people. 
right? So, so the problems of racism are problems of society and democracy. They're not problems that are limited to colored people or about just helping colored people. Um, they're about managing what is the birth defect of our nation, which is aspirations of, of liberty and freedom, but are intertwined with racism on the ground uh, and oppression in the most brutal sense. And we're still within that shadow. So that's my answer. <laughs> but uh, Kevin, let me go back to you. Um, because you mentioned the role of Asian Americans in affirmative action controversies. And to, to set the background for that, uh, early affirmative action controversies often involve universities and their admissions policies. And the plaintiffs in those early cases were typically white. Um, that was the case in the first big affirmative action case the Supreme Court uh, decided, Abaki, the University of California Regents involving UC Davis. That was the case in the subsequent cases involving the University of Michigan, both the undergrad and law school admissions process. Uh, that was the case in Texas, in the, the Fisher v. Texas litigation. But in the more recent spate of litigations, uh, in particular involving Harvard University, the plaintiffs have been Asian Americans. And that is a twist, right? Because typically you had whites arguing against policies that benefited minorities, but now you have minorities on both sides of the ledger, so to speak. Uh, so that changes the valence a little bit. And it seems from other indications as well that Asian Americans are becoming more prominent in controversies about affirmative action. So could you shed some light on that, the changing role of Asian Americans in affirmative action litigation and policy disputes? Yeah, I'm happy to speak a bit about that. I think for context, it is still part of the conservative playbook. Like the conscious switching from white plaintiffs to Asian American plaintiffs was very calculated. I think at a certain point there was a gray area where I believe even Stanford was implicated um, in the 80s in like there was somewhat of a quota on Asian American students at a certain point. And, but I think where it's moved on is that Asian Americans are being portrayed as the main victims, where it's our black and brown kids are held up against Asian American um, children. And I think we're supposed to decide between them when this is really a distraction from the real issues. Like we've seen, I think it was just last year, it feels like such a long time ago, but the admission scandal um, really unearthed that there is, that the bigger issue in schooling is really, um, like legacy admissions, admissions related to athletes. Like there's just these enormous institutions built upon wealth and access that aren't even being addressed. So they would rather have people of color fight amongst themselves over what are the perceived of as scraps when there are these much larger issues that we should be banding together to fix. And I think one thing to be cautious of, and I think you alluded to it earlier, Professor Banks, is the issue of tokenization. I think when people say like, we've had a black president things are better now. Um, or I think a joke that's bit, that was popular on Twitter was we need more black female prison guards as a way to fix abolition. And I think that kind of tweet, like it is facetious, it is like just as a joke, but it does bring to light some of the issues of, and some of the problems of having a face that matches up with what might be seen as being more politically correct, but it nearly um, exasperates the issue. And another example recently is, um, I'm thinking of the recent head of ICE is now a Vietnamese refugee. Like he's the interim um, ICE head. But I think by putting a Vietnamese refugee in that position, I think on a certain level, we're supposed to think like things are fixed. Like we have Asian immigrants administering mm -hmm. our incredibly punitive immigration enforcement system. So I think going forward, I think the debate about affirmative action will continue to get more nuanced. But I think we have to be careful about issues like that, where it's like tokenization, where it's about telling specific groups that now that you've hit certain markers, you've made it, like, welcome to whiteness, let's work together against other people. And I think that's a major issue that Asian Americans, that other groups will have to, like, battle against in the years to come. Okay. The, uh, so let me ask you a question specifically about the, the Harvard litigation, right? So this is a, a case that was, this is a civil lawsuit filed against Harvard, although Harvard's a private university, is covered by the same laws that apply to public universities uh, based on Supreme Court precedent, because the court has established that the, the federal statutes that govern a university like Harvard incorporate the same standard as the constitutional rules. So Harvard is subject to the same set of laws as public universities. And the, the claim in that civil litigation was that Harvard was imposing a uh, quota or a ceiling 
on the admission of Asian uh, American applicants uh, and that that was sort of tied in with the race conscious affirmative ac action policy. So the litigants seek to have the university uh, be race blind, completely race blind in its admissions practices and to not even know the race of applicants so that more uh, Asian Americans would be admitted. And your view is that that framing is uh, misleading uh, in terms of understanding what's happening in college admissions. So could you just sort of say a little bit more about that? How is that framing misleading? The, the argument is that affirmative action is part of what keeps Asian Americans out because universities are taking account of race in favor of some groups and implicitly at least to disfavor other groups. Right, I think the Harvard litigation is interesting because it really split Asian American advocacy groups. Like it's, mm -hmm. even though, like I said, it's the same conservative strategist behind the Harvard lawsuit. I'm sure he has ties to the Yale lawsuit that was filed in the last yeah. few days, but he was the same man that funded and like really orchestrated the Fisher litigation that took affirmative action to yep. the Supreme Court. And I think one of the things is when it came to, when it was brought to the court, I think there was a, obviously a lot of analysis over whether or not Asian Americans were actually impacted. And I think they couldn't, they said that there were problematic things that Harvard did, but it did not amount to discrimination. Obviously, mm -hmm. like this is still an issue that might go up to the Supreme Court, but I think there's it's not the same as the soft racial quotas even that were applied to Jewish Americans in the early 20th mm -hmm. century. And even though that isn't quite the same uh, parallel, I think all the headlines, I think all the public discourse was Asian Americans, are they the new Jews? Which obviously is offensive to all kinds of groups. Um, but I think when the discussion is again, like are Asian Americans being kept out like Jewish Americans were, they're not. Um, we look at all the data, we look at enrollment patterns, we look at admissions numbers, like there was no drop in API admissions like after affirmative action um, was rolled out. So I think when it comes down to it and you look that there's no impact, um, there's actually, like there might be some things that Harvard could do differently, but it doesn't make sense to throw out the entire system just because mm -hmm. some groups may have had problems with it, so. Okay. Okay, so we'll have to see. So that, that litigation, I believe that that case is on appeal now. Uh, it's being considered by the uh, U.S. Court of Appeals uh, for the First Circuit, I believe, and we'll have to see what happens with that. Um, the uh, one more question though, before we leave admissions. Uh, you know, one claim that, that, that is, is kind of part of the opposition to affirmative action is that, you know, it would really be better if schools like Harvard and Stanford, if they were simply to admit students based on grades and test scores, uh, just admit the best students and, you know, don't consider race either way, let the chips fall where they may. Would that be a good system or, or would that be objectionable? I can start off on this one because I think it's tied to something I said earlier that, um, we know that these, these structures of oppression are so deeply tied to one another, right? And so, you know, if you're just admitting on who has the best test scores or who has the best grades, but you're doing that devoid of looking at the context of what schools get the best resources, mm -hmm. what students have more access to, you know, study prep and tutors and this, that, and the other. Now there are, you know, there, one of the ways that folks have tried to creatively handle some of the challenges to affirmative action and essentially the legal requirement that like, you can't go straight to race, you have to try other things first is mm -hmm. to say that that the top percentage of students at each you know particular school mm -hmm. could be admitted right and so rather than just saying we're going to put everybody in the same pot and whoever has the best grades and the best test scores they get to get in it's saying we're going to look at you by school and if mm -hmm. you are one of the top students at your school you're going to have a better chance of getting in here and in some cases that has helped with um, more diverse admissions, but the reasons it has helped with more diverse admissions is because our schools are so segregated. Mm -hmm. And so if you say it will take the top students at every school, there are many schools that are like, you know, 80% Latino, 80% Black. Um, 
And so sure, there, there are ways you can maybe change that in a little bit, but even if you do that and then it starts to work, it's still based on this acknowledgement that our systems are so intrinsically tied to systemic racism mm -hmm. that, that we can't ignore that when we are trying to gatekeep who gets into our institutions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'll add to that. I think it's like, okay. I don't need to require, I think we're all aware of the limited predictive value of standardized tests. So I think if you look at the intent behind some of the tests, it literally is supposed, like the SAT is supposed to predict your first year of college grades, I mm -hmm. believe. And like similar with the LSAT, like it's not supposed to predict who becomes a great lawyer ultimately. It's just supposed to predict your, maybe your first year of grades or 1L year grades. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that, like, like Tamika pointed out, it reflects kind of the systematic, um, like, racist mechanisms that have kept people back. Like, it doesn't make sense to just use test scores. And kind of the case that Tamika mentioned was actually at the core of the Fisher case, where Texas wanted to diversify its schools using a mm -hmm. top 10%, but it relied on having race, like, race-segregated schools in mm -hmm. order to draw upon that diversity. Mm -hmm. um, and I think something else I, I want to point out is that Obviously, schools have tried to dance around the issue of using race. So when they use things like social economic status, when they've used things like class, it hasn't been enough. Like race is just such a unique and persistent beast that the only way to address it is to address it head on. And I think the way that affirmative action as an issue is moving through the courts, it actually really narrows um, the issue to one that where we can't even consider um, rectifying past inequality, where it's about... If you look at the transcripts, if you look at the briefs being filed, um, all the discussion in the lawsuits around affirmative action are about the benefits of diversity. Like mm -hmm. how will these students interact with the multicultural world or how will they be um, useful for a capitalist society? There is no recognition of, like, like Tamika pointed out, like people remembering slavery, like people mm -hmm. remembering and confronting racism on a daily mm -hmm. basis. It's just like absent. Yeah. But Kevin, are you suggesting then that that diversity is in some way a is is itself a distraction from the conversation we should be having? Is that what I'm hearing? It I wouldn't call it a full distraction, but I think when the courts have said that diversity is all that we can look at, I mm -hmm. think it really reorganizes the progressive case for affirmative mm -hmm. action, where it has to be about diversity. So when you're putting together your brief pro-affirmative action, you're suddenly looking at um, sociologists who can tell you the value of diversity, who can tell you how bullying and like racial hate has gone down, but then it completely erases the discussion around past, um, I guess, racist policies. Like you simply can't bring that up because courts have over and over said that that's not enough, that that's too broad of a that's too broad of a policy goal, or like Professor Banks, you pointed out, they say, this is already dealt with. Like we've already moved beyond that. Right. But yeah, if, and that's, but so if, if we put the constitutional law aside though, would we say that you know, diversity is an argument for affirmative action, but it's not the best argument for affirmative action. It's not really, it's not the real reason that we engage in affirmative action as a society. Uh, and if that's the view we take, then what are the better reasons for affirmative action, uh, if not diversity? Uh, I'll let Kevin answer on this, on this specific question. I just want to go back to, to something he, he said that I agree with. I think, you know, one of the things I do is I travel all over and I public speak and I give trainings on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think too often when people say diversity, they think they're all talking about the same thing. It's, you know, it, I, I heard a professor once say, it's like the color blue. Some people are saying diversity and they mean navy. Some people are saying diversity and they mean electric blue. Some people, you know, mean aqua, whatever it may be. And, and for, for too often, they're not talking about race because we have been politely told not to talk about race. And so whenever I give these trainings, there's undoubtedly someone who says, but why are we only talking about race? Why aren't we talking about these other isms, right? And as a queer person, like I, I get it, right? Like as a woman, I get it. But what I always try to explain to people is when you control on every other kind of demographic diverse thing you can, race is still that indicator in our country where we are not moving forward, where we are not figuring it out, where we are not necessarily getting better. And so we have to be able to talk about it directly because if we don't talk about it, we might be talking about a lot of 
you know, members of the blue family, but we're not talking about the color blue or we're all talking about different blues. And so I do think it's important when, when you're having these conversations, you have to be able to talk about race directly or something is lost in that. That's a great point. And, and so you're suggesting that in conversations about, about the color blue, the actual color blue may get lost as we talk about all the variants of the color blue. Uh, and in fact, the color blue is what we need to be talking about. That's what motivates the whole conversation. Exactly, because it's not, you know, especially when we talk about class or income. I live in Los Angeles now. I am sitting right now in Baldwin Hills, you know, fancy black neighborhood. MTV did a show about the, the rich <laughs> black kids in the hills, right? Like, this is a place where there is a lot of money. It's also the place where there is the most active, mm -hmm. largest active oil drilling site in the country. Mm -hmm. And it's not because these folks don't have money. Mm -hmm. It's because they're Black. And mm -hmm. so we have to, we, we can't lose it. And you're right, absolutely. We get, we get caught up in talking about everything else that sometimes we don't talk about race directly, which is what we should be talking about. Okay. That's getting, and Kevin, do you, do you agree with that idea that sometimes race gets lost in the diversity discussion? I would agree with that. I think it's, it's an issue that can't quite come up just because like people are uncomfortable discussing it. I think that's why we've talked about like people actively looking for ways to get at the race issue, but without mm -hmm. naming it. Right. Um, I think there is like a collective like belief that if only we were to wish ourselves past mm -hmm. it into a colorblind society, we could. Yeah. But yeah. I think it's also the other, the counterpart of it is also, there's a lot of hard work in mm -hmm. working past where we are now towards a more just society. Um, yeah. and I think another, great, oh, go ahead. No, so these are great points, yeah. I was just gonna say that, so, and, and so to Mika's point, it, it fits Kevin the point you made earlier because to Mika's point, your point is about race getting lost in the discussion. And Kevin, your point is that the Supreme Court doctrine sort of facilitates that or, or kind of creates that state of affairs because the Supreme Court ironically has said, okay, you may be able to have in certain circumstances affirmative action, but even when you do, you can't really talk about race uh, directly. You have to frame it all in terms of diversity. Uh, and, and technically, if we want to get into the details of it, you know, the compelling interest for affirmative action in college admissions is not race. It's the educational benefits of diversity. And if you were to tie it more explicitly to race at the, at, at the first step, you might be taking yourself across the line into illegality. Uh, so the court is actually disabling, in a sense, the very conversations that perhaps we should be having uh, about race. Uh, but we too often don't have those conversations. So um, that's sad, but we will end on a high point before we end. So, um, let's talk about pragmatically um, what to do, what needs to happen to go back to the uh, early issues that, that Tamika raised, uh, passing a law like Prop 16. This is a ballot initiative that allows state institutions to engage in affirmative action. It doesn't require affirmative action, much less any particular outcomes. It merely creates a possibility. So given that situation of possibility, assuming we have that, uh, what should we as you know, individuals, students, professors, activists, lawyers, what should we be thinking about doing to move from possibility to, to results, if you will? This is where we give people practical take home messages. Like what, no really, what to do? And, and that's, a, that's a question that a lot of people have been asking, uh, you know, since George Floyd's death, frankly, is they have become aware of the pervasiveness of injustice. And this is, oh, they're struck by it. And then the next question is, but what do I do? So what are some of the things that people can do? You, <laughs> go ahead, Kevin. Go ahead. I I'll think start we're with the decision. quick one. I think I think an easy one to at least start with. Like I, I guess I want to lay out first that it is hard work that we're going to have to confront, like anti-blackness, anti like just anti-blackness within the Asian American community is something that needs to be discussed. Um, okay, I, I didn't know if you were going to go there, but now that you, <laughs> <laughs> I yes. know that like in this past summer there have been initiatives to do so. Like there's been Asians for Black Lives. There's been very public efforts to translate BLM materials into mm -hmm. Vietnamese, into Chinese, into Korean. Um, there's been like 
montages of people really talking to their parents and grandparents about the issue. And again, I think that, that like, that's a great start. But I think there's also a lot of, like we talked about earlier um, with Alex Ohanian, there's a lot of focus on kind of the performa performative aspects of wokeness. And I think as people start to engage their families in these discussions, it has to move beyond kind of the emotional, like navel gazing and kind of the self gaze and moving more towards like, what can we do? Like, do we turn out at protests? Do we turn out to support um, black and brown folks like in settings where our communities are less comfortable. Um, I think something I think about a lot when I talk to my clients is when I do intakes with them and I just talk to them about mental health or about um, incarceration, they like, there's a laugh. And that laugh always means the same thing to me where they don't know anyone that's ever been to prison or jail. They don't know anyone that has a mental health issue, but Ultimately, at the end of the day, we know that that's simply not true, that there's just mm -hmm. these walls of stigma and like silence, like people simply don't feel comfortable discussing these issues. And I think we need to start having those hard conversations. And then out of those hard conversations, like listen and learn and find out where we can center um, just more marginalized people in our discussions. So I think that's at least a major start that sort okay. of can do. Let me, let me ask you to, to, to say more. You mentioned the issue of anti-Blackness among Asian Americans. Uh, could you say more about that? What are, what are the dimensions of that problem? Where does it come from? Uh, and then, I mean, you've already talked a bit about what to do about it, but where does that come from? What, what's your analysis of that? Yeah, it's something that I've, uh, I've like dealt with throughout my life as someone who grew up in Chinatown. Like I've heard just how innocuous kind of the anti-Blackness can be in that it comes up, it comes up like through media narratives. Like people are immigrants from another place, they don't have the context of like white black racism. Um, mm -hmm. They find themselves into, inserted into a society where, again, their kids are struggling for what it seems like a limited number of spaces, like in jobs, in schools. Um, and then people see it as, um, also there's like the issue of isolation. Like a lot of people in the East Asian community don't necessarily know any black people. So I think there are so many roots to it, but I think a lot of it is that these communities aren't necessarily talking. Um, so, so, so that's the story about lack of information and interaction. Um, what, what I was wondering if you were gonna say was this idea that uh, one of the ways people become American is actually to, to absorb uh, anti-blackness. Uh, that that's part of the process of, of Americanization, frankly, is to, you know, situate oneself uh, with respect to the Black other. Mm -hmm. uh, that, yeah, I, no, that, that's certainly a great point. I think that's what I was trying to get at by kind of the constant invitation to Asian Americans and to other minority groups, like where Black and brown folks are kept out of kind of certain institutions while right. other people are welcomed in, and then they're like being put forward as the model. Like, if they can do it, why can't you? And I think it, Asian Americans are asked to buy into that narrative in order to justify kind of her entry into whiteness. So I think that does happen at like at every level of society right now. And I think you're right, Professor Banks, in that on a certain level, you have to say, no, like I'm recognizing this bargain I'm being given and I have to recognize the cost to other people as opposed to just focusing on my individual outcome. Okay. Yeah, we're definitely a country that's built on a scarcity mindset, not a mindset of mm -hmm. abundance, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think that's from our discovery. We we put forth this ideal that if you work hard um, and give it everything you have, you will be successful. But we don't like to talk about the history or the fact that folks who who were successful had to still land and exploit free labor in order to be successful, right? Like they had to rely on other people to get what it is um, they ultimately coveted. And so I think this idea of individualism and that there are only so few things, um, it's, it's what Kevin said, it's part of the, the old school conservative playbook pit folks against each other. And every so often you see that erupt in you know, the LA uprisings um, and, and affirmative action debates. Um, and I, I do think that a first step for everybody is how are you gonna how are you gonna educate yourself about 
white supremacy and anti-blackness because anti-blackness is real. Everyone is struggling so hard to get proximity to whiteness that they, we are who they don't want to be. And I think we are in a country where increasingly um, the political divide and the vitriol with which we speak about these things, no one wants to be called a racist. And because Mm -hmm. no one wants to to be called a racist, we don't talk about race. And what we have to be able to do is realize that there are times when all of us do things that are racist. Like that's just what it is. But if we can't talk about it, if we can't name it, and if we can't own it, we can't push that forward, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget moving to LA and saying to my wife, I need a lady doctor. And she's like, go to my lady. She's in Pasadena. It's beautiful. There's jazz. There's, there's, you know, (laughs) cucumber water. You're going to love it. I love that cucumber water. Yeah. yeah, Like, she's like, it's going to be great. I walk into the appointment and then walks a black woman and I am shocked. And I go home and I say to her, why didn't you tell me your doctor was black? And she looks at me and says, why did you assume she wasn't? And, and I think that's something that we all have to acknowledge that when we hear that woman's voice on the airplane, we mm-hmm. all say to ourselves, oh, pilot's a woman. And again, because we are in this fake wokeness, no one wants to acknowledge that they had that thought. Mm -hmm. But we all have been socialized in this country, in this Mm -hmm. society, Mm -hmm. where we have continued to villainize and Mm -hmm. to make certain groups of people the other. And if we Mm -hmm. can't confront those things directly and talk about those Mm -hmm. things directly, then we can't ever make change. So first, Mm -hmm. there has to be some individual change. Too Mm -hmm. often, folks hear these things or they go to an implicit bias workshop and they say, all right, well, it's implicit and it's built into structure. So I wasn't a slave owner. I didn't do anything. So there has to be some personal responsibility that you need to educate yourself and then you need to make concrete actions. How are you gonna speak up and how are you not just gonna be on the sidelines? Mm -hmm. But we also need our institutions to change. We need to realize that our institutions are made up of people, that our policies and our laws are constructed by people. And so we have to start saying, how are we not just going to, you know, something my grandmother always says, like every black grandmother, you can't just talk about it. You got to be about it. You got to be about it. And so and so we need folks to not just throw their hands up and say, Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do this or Mm -hmm. I'm not Asian or I'm not black or I don't have any black friends. I don't know how to do this. First, think deeply about why you don't have any black Mm -hmm. friends, but then realize when I got to Stanford Law School and everybody had money and people were like, did you read this article on on NPR? Like, I didn't know what any of that meant. I went to my first law school, like fancy legal dinner and I will never forget going to a steakhouse and being like, yo, you got A1 or Heinz 57? And then one of my like white friends nudged me and they're like, no, when steak is good. Yeah. You don't need steak sauce, right? And so I think so many of us have been- You know, actually go with ketchup when it's really good, right? <laughs> ketchup. So many of us have been dropped in these situations where even though we didn't know what was going to happen, we've mm-hmm. had to figure it out because mm-hmm. our privilege didn't allow us to do anything mm-hmm. else. I am a black woman in this country who has graduated from Stanford Law School, and I have made something of myself that my dad and his 14 brothers and sisters growing up in the project selling drugs could have never imagined. But that's what black folks have always done. That's what immigrants have always done. We've always been able to imagine something that doesn't yet exist, but still work like hell for it. And so folks who want to help solve racism and anti-blackness have to realize that even though they don't know what the answer is, they have to be willing to work towards it every day. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's, that's a good point to close on, I think. Um, the, uh, I mean, I won't even try to summarize that, except that to say that I, I think you, you would both agree with something that my father used to say, which is that if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And that wherever you're situated, uh, there's something you can do. Uh, and the challenge is to figure out what you can do uh, but the idea of being neutral and staying on the sidelines is to position yourself as part of the problem. So, okay. Um, we have just a couple more minutes. Uh, would you all like to offer just a very brief closing remark to our students? So kind of transport yourself back about a decade in time, uh, you know, answer the question, you know, what do I know now that I wish I knew then? Right? What should they keep in mind as they're going through law school, as they're thinking about the period after law school? 
Sorry, that's like, it's career advice? Is that yeah, what just, we're saying? Just, just give some advice to your younger self. Just in a sentence or two. Is there any, any one piece of advice that, that you wish you, that you think now would have benefited you then? This can be in the category of questions that students might not even know to ask, but that would mm. benefit them if they had the answer. I think what I would say is that nothing works out the way you plan it out to be, but that that's a good and a bad thing. I think looking back at the 10 years since law school, I couldn't have imagined the jobs I've taken. And I think at each point, I felt like I was going to lose everything and that like my life was going to be in shambles. But like every time it happened, it worked out and I think I'm the better for it. Like I think if I were able to plan it all in advance, and have it all make sense. And I think nowadays when I introduce myself, I make it make sense because that's mm -hmm. how people work. Um, but I think it's just trust and know that things will work out in a different way than you intended. So. That is fabulous advice. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with that. There's no right way to be a lawyer. Um, there, you know, there is, there, there are things you, you shouldn't do. I guess the right way is to not do things illegally. But right, think, you want to stay on the right side of the law. Right, right. Stay on the right side of the law. But other than that, don't don't let don't let yourself get put into this box of what your legal career must look like. And then the quote I always say whenever I speak, and I particularly say it for folks who are members of a press group, particularly for women of color and particularly for black women, is you don't have to light yourself on fire to keep other people warm. Like Mm -hmm. This is hard work. Um, mm -hmm. And so just just know that that it's not one little fight. It's it's a lifetime of, of of change you're working for. And so know that it's a revolutionary act to take care of yourself. OK, those are wonderful pieces of advice. So that ends this session. Uh, we will return with Tuesday Race Talks on October 27th uh, at a time slot later in the evening. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Tamika. Uh, I have so enjoyed this conversation. Uh, thank you for joining us. Signing off Thank now. you. Thank you.